fundamental narrative about Israel essentially is that as a compensation for the Holocaust, the Jews were given a piece of someone else's land in the Middle East where they've settled. And now there is a battle over that piece of land because of that original sin, if you like, which is uh, a viewpoint that, frankly, uh, up until I started listening to some of your, to your talks, it was unshakable in my really? understanding. Yeah, absolutely. Be I, be because I don't know. I honestly don't yeah, know. Yeah, enough yeah, about that, it. That's yeah. the, the default narrative. Yeah. yeah. Is in what way is that not the case, Melanie? Every single thing that you've just said is untrue. Mm -hmm. oh, most of your conversations. <laughs> <laughs> That'll make him happy. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's a big subject. But the idea that the Jews had no connection to the land of Israel until um, a guilt-ridden West uh, took them out as a remnant of the Holocaust and stuck them into someone else's country is the opposite of the truth. So what is the truth? The on Jews are the only people for whom the land of Israel was ever their national kingdom hundreds and hundreds of years before Islam was even invented and before the Arabs invaded. The Jews uh, were the original nation, the original nation upon which America and Britain, in a kind of mystical fashion in Britain, modeled themselves. Why do I say that? They were a nation because they were a people in a particular area of land which they governed according to laws they made and which they defended. Now, they were a nation for several hundred years under various kings. And then they were uh, basically kicked out and then they returned, then they kicked out again. Um, and then the, that land of Israel was occupied by vast numbers of different civilizations. Um, the Romans, uh, the Assyrians, the uh, Arabs, uh, various, various sorts of Muslims, uh, Christians, Crusaders, um, and for a long period, the Ottoman Turks, who were Muslim but not Arab. And then we get to the turn of the last century. And there grew up in Britain as a result of, mainly as a result of evangelical Christianity, a movement to return the Jews to their ancestral homeland. People were called Christian Zionists. And the kind of apogee of Christian Zionism in political terms was the Balfour Declaration in 1917. It was a cabinet which was dominated by Christian Zionists. And they believed that it was um, uh, their duty to help the Jews return to re restore their ancient homeland. Long story short, as you will know, after the First World War, the entire Middle East was carved up mm. between mm. Britain and France, which, you know, in itself was a questionable uh, activity. And they created Makes for various... nice straight lines on the map, <laughs> doesn't it? Well, well, well yes, uh, slightly uh, more complicated than straight lines. But anyway, so, you know, some of these uh, countries that they created, you know, you can say that's very questionable. But basically, the precursor of the United Nations, which was then the League of Nations, yes. in the 1920s, decided that um, as a matter of international treaty obligation, um, Britain would be given custodianship of what was then called Palestine, yeah. a name given to it insultingly by the Romans in order to erase its Jewish identity. The British would be given cust custodianship of Palestine called the Mandate, under which Britain would be under a binding treaty obligation to return the Jews to their ancestral homeland to recreate it. Now, what was Palestine at the time? Well, a bit of it, a very large chunk of it, was promptly given away to the Arabs by Winston Churchill to become Transjordan, which is now Jordan. So what did that leave as the territory within which Britain had a binding duty undertaken by the world body of the time to return the Jews as a matter of historic right? What was that territory? It is what is now Israel, what is called the West Bank and Gaza. That is the territory to which the Jews alone were given the right to return because they alone had ruled it. Terms which have never been abrogated, even though the League of Nations is no more, it gave rise to the United Nations. But the United Nations took on, in its charter, it took on all the obligations of its predecessor unless they were specifically abrogated. Those terms have never been abrogated. So what then happened was, although the Arabs at the time, around 1917, 1918, King Faisal notably, and one or two others, they said, Welcome, we welcome back the Jews to their ancestral homeland. They used this term because it was in, in their own religion. They, they knew this was a Jewish homeland. And then a lot of stuff happened. Basically, the British, having undertaken in the first place uh, this duty to settle the Jews in their ancestral homeland, the, the British colonial uh, office at the time and the colonial administrators who were put into Palestine to administer this mandate did everything they could to stop it.
And they, among other things, brought in a, an Islamic firebrand. This was at the time when Islamism, as we know it, political Islam, was growing. It was sort of invented after the First World War. And they brought in, the British brought in a particular Islamic firebrand called Haj Amin al-Husseini as the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. And he incited, he was brought in to incite revolt, and he did. There were then pogroms after pogroms after pogroms of the returning Jews. And uh, the thing then blew up into a sort of three-sided war, Jews and Arabs and British, or basically at various times all fighting each other. Scroll on, um, the British threw in the towel, gave it over to the United Nations. The United Nations, Britain, had, Britain by this time had reneged on its obligation to settle the Jews in the land. Britain had decided the only way to solve this was to give a portion of this land to the Arabs in order to shut them up and stop them from fighting. And in accordance with that, the British closed the gates of Palestine at the time when the Jews were starting to be exterminated in Europe. That's what happened. And then the United Nations took over, the war finished, the United Nations took over. The United Nations said, just like Britain had said, right, two states, two state solution, one for Jews, one for the Arabs. And just as with every, and every occasion since then, the Jews said, what? You're going to take this away from us? Fine. Fine. Give us anything. Anything. Because we're desperate. And the Arabs said, what? Jews? Here? Never. And they invaded, or they went to war against the Jewish homeland. There was a, what's called the War of Independence, which amazingly the Jews won against all the odds. Subsequently, there have been, I've forgotten how many, two, three, four offers of a state of Palestine to the Arabs, which have been made by Israel. At every occasion, the Arabs have refused and have gone to war or have stepped up terrorist activity against Israelis. Now, before we go any further into that part of it, I just want to come back to this homeland idea, this idea that many, many centuries ago, a certain, if we strip away the identities and we just go, many, many moons ago, a certain group of people had a kingdom in this area. And after that, there have been 10 civilizations or 15 civilizations that have come and lived in this land. And now, for some reason, it's, it's kind of like me, isn't it a bit like me going, well, I used to, you know, I grew up in this flat mm -hmm. in Moscow, mm -hmm. and now I want to be resettled there. Yeah. And all the neighbors have agreed to mm -hmm. kick out that guy who lives there now mm -hmm. and put me in that flat instead. Yeah, Is it except, not a bit like well, that? Well, no, it's not like that. First of all, the Jews never left the land. They were always coming back to it, um, even under occupation. There was always a Jewish presence in the land, and from the mid-19th century onwards, there was a Jewish majority in Jerusalem. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing was that the land at the time of the mandate was very sparsely populated. The people who were there were mainly nomadic Arabs, but they didn't have an identity. They were, they considered themselves to be part of Syria, which was created, um, or Bedouin. They were, they, there was no such thing as Palestinians. Palestinians were the Jews. Um, but there were people who lived there. There were point. people who lived there, yes. Right. And then because the Jews started coming back, um, Arabs started, Arabs and others started pouring in from neighboring Arab lands. And the British let, let them come in, even though they were, many of them, illegal immigrants. They let them come in because they wanted to stop a Jewish homeland. So it's not a question of kicking people out. Mm. Um, it's a, it's, uh, it's, and it's not a question of, you know, people who had some sort of mystical attachment to some country. You're talking about the Jewish people who have been persecuted in virtually every country in which they've settled. No country ever, ever wanted them, apart from India and China, which have never had a problem with their Jewish populations. But in Europe, mm. no way. Nobody wanted them. Um, and it was in respect of that, as well as the fact that they were the original nation and have always wanted to go back. They were considered to have the right to go back. Um, so, so is this kind of perpetual persecution? What I, I'm just trying to get this logically clear. Perpetual persecution of, of Jews in oh, Europe yes. mm -hmm. is that what? uniquely in the history of humanity gives Jews the right to resettle a land in which they didn't have that much of a presence. No, for, no, it for was centuries. their country. But a long time ago. Oh, okay. So why do people think that if they think that it was the Palestinians' country a long time ago, that's, that means that they should have it? But they were living there in but the 19th weren't. century. But they weren't. There was no such thing as the Palestinians. Mm. There was no such thing as the Palestinian people. There was no Palestinian people until it was invented in the mid-1960s. Well, there was these nomadic Arabs who lived there. Yeah, but right? they didn't want a country of their own. The Jews were a nation. They had a country of their own. Mm. 
and mm. it was taken away from them, and then they were persecuted around the world. Mm. And so it seemed only decent and fair that they should have it back. Mm. And a lot of people at the time thought that was absolutely fine. But it was, it was a resistance whipped up, which was basically a religious resistance, in my view, um, and remains basically a religious resistance. Um, because if you look at the Arab world, uh, the Muslim world, unfortunately, and look at the Palestinian Arabs and what they are producing uh, day by day in terms of what they teach their children and the materials that they put out, it's not it's not really accurate just to say it's anti-Israel, which indeed it is. Um, and it's it's certainly the case that they want, in my view, uh, and I think this is proven by what they say and what they do and their insignia and their flags and their materials, they want Israel gone. They don't want two states. They want Israel gone. But it's much worse than that. What they're producing day by day is, is anti-Jewish venom, crude, conspiratorial. Jews are uniquely the source of evil in the world. That's what they're producing. That's what they're teaching their children uh, to hate. And people in the West just have no idea of this because it is never, ever reported. And so I got into a lot of difficulty because um, until the year 2000, I'd never been to Israel, never wanted to go. I thought as a British Jew, I was, you know, it was, it was, it was great. It was fine. It was nothing to do with me. And I'd bought into quite a lot of the stuff that, you know, we've been talking mm. about because, you know, if, if you don't know about the Middle East, why would you think any, any different? In 1982, when I was at The Guardian, um, I was brought up very sharply against the fact that as a British Jew, um, I spoke as a matter of fairness about why there seemed to be a double standard in the reporting of Israel at that time, as opposed to reporting of Syria. Syria at that time um, had murdered or caused to be killed um, between 15 and 40,000 opponents of President Assad, the father of the mm. President mm. Assad. And it was virtually not reported at the Guardian. It was a few paragraphs. It was, it was nothing. Whereas Israel was at war in the Lebanon and it was a front page story every day. It was furious editorials. It was outrage op eds. And I said, why is there a double standard? And that's when I realized the racism of the left because I was told, um, of course there's a double standard. You don't expect us to treat the developing world like us. The developing world is not brought up as we are to respect human life. Consequently, we can't judge them by our standards. That's racism. And I went, <laughs> what? <laughs> so let me get this right. If someone's born into the developing world, they're not entitled to the same rights to life and liberty as we are? Isn't that racism? <laughs> and they said, why are you so upset? We do you the great honor. I became you. Mm -hmm. Like that. Mm. You. We do you the great honor of assuming that you and Israel, and I became Israel, mm. <laughs> that you and Israel uh, adhere to the same principles as we do. Respect for human life. So we judge you by our standards. Mm. And what's more, you tell us that you are morally superior to us, so we should judge you by higher standards. And that's when I realized the anti-Semitism of the left and the racism of the left. And that's when I first realized that my naive belief that we were all marching to the same tune, behind the same banner of decency, was not the case. They were on the other side. And then I didn't do any more stuff about any of that for a long time. And then in the year 2000, when the Intifada started, the Second Intifada, as it was called, something very similar happened. Israelis are being blown to bits in pizza parlors and cafes and in buses in Israel. And um, several thousand were murdered. And from the get-go in Britain, um, Israel was totally condemned for taking condign action to stop it. And as a matter of justice and fairness, I said, what is this? Why are you behaving like this? And everybody went, oh, she's a Jew. She's not properly British. And that was when I realized as a British Jew, you could not support the Jewish people as a people. Not allowed. Um, and that's when I realized something was very, very badly wrong. Uh, with Britain's attitude to Jews, not just to Israel, but to Jews, and that, but that the two were bound up together, uh, because Israel was being presented, not least by the BBC, as basically the fount of all evil in the Middle East. It was an aggressive country. It behaved illegally. All of this, in my view, as I came to believe over many years subsequently, all of it was a lie. But that's what everyone was told. And so consequently, if you were a Jew standing up for all this, then of course you were also evil. Of course you were. And this was a shattering really shattering 
set of developments for me. And eventually, kind of long story short, or shorter, I came to put all that together.